wasn't political because he didn't call the Jews to rise up against the Romans. That just shows how limited people's understanding of what politics are about. Jesus was not interested in fomenting a revolution of Jews against the Romans because, in fact, he was not interested in changing the regime. He was interested in changing the system. Now, what am I talking about? Let me start, tell you what I'm talking about. Jesus was interested in transforming hierarchies into mutualities. He actually said to his disciples stuff like this. Um, I have come not to be served, but to serve. I'm not interested in this. I'm not interested in playing this game. You, know, you see the way that those pagans operate? Where they, the rulers boss everybody around? He said to his disciples, it shall not be so among you. Right? As far as Jesus was concerned, it was forbidden. Forbidden. Now, it's hard to believe that, isn't it? When you actually look at the way churches operate. Right? It's often our modus operandi to operate like that. But Jesus said, I don't want that to be the way it is amongst you. In case you didn't get it, he said to them explicitly, don't let anybody call you rabbi or pastor or teacher or leader or stuff like that. Did you know this was forbidden by Jesus? I mean, it's hard to believe, isn't it? He said, and what's the reason he gives? For you have one father and the rest of you are brothers and sisters. Look at the language. Look at the language. It's about mutuality, not hierarchy. Do you understand? Now, <clears throat> so Paul took this on. Paul began saying stuff like, there should be no masters or slaves, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And he started to reframe all the hierarchical relationships in the Roman Empire in terms of mutuality one at a time. This is the great revolution. Did you get that? You don't believe me, do you? Look at Philemon. Look at Philemon. A, um, an escaped slave came to Paul by the name of Onesimus. Onesimus becomes a believer, right? Everybody familiar with the story? Then uh, Paul says, look, mm, you really need to go home. But Onesimus is saying, are you kidding? <laughs> Do you realise what happens to escaped slaves? <laughs> you know, they get killed. And Paul says, no, we've got to... You need to work this out with Philemon. I mean, working this out with Philemon? <laughs> In that culture? I mean, it's, it's presuming a level of dialogue and engagement among equals. Paul says, don't worry, I'll write you a letter. <laughs> now listen to this letter. Listen to this letter. This has got to be one of the most remarkable doc documents in the whole of ancient history because it actually reframes hierarchy in terms of mutuality in an extraordinary fashion. And it's only because we kind of get used to the Bible, that we just forget how radical this is. Listen to this. Now, as I read this out, I want you to note for yourself that the ways in which Paul reframes the hierarchy in terms of mutuality. Okay? This is the letter that he writes to Philemon. I appeal to you for my son Onesimus, who became my son while I was in chains. Formerly he was useless to you, but now he's become useful both to you and to me. That's a play on the word anesimus about usefulness. He said, I am sending him, who is very, my very heart, back to you. And I would have liked to keep him with me so he could take your place in helping me while I'm in change for the gospel. 
but I did not want to do anything without your consent. She's very dear to me, but even dearer to you, both as a man and as a brother in the Lord. So if you consider me a partner, welcome him as you would welcome me. And if he has done you any wrong or owes you anything, charge it to me. Now, isn't that stunning? That is astounding stuff. What are some of the ways he reframes the hierarchy in terms of mutuality? What are some of the expressions he uses? My son. Yes. So it starts out with son. That's a hierarchical relationship. And then how does he reframe? Brother. 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 It's my brother. He's your brother. Right? Equality. What are some of the other language that he uses? Dear friend. Dear friend, yes. Partner. Mm. Right? These are... Mutual words. Yes, what else? He's valuable to me. He is valuable to me. Yes, that's right. And it can become valuable to you. Valuable to you too, right? Yes. So I wonder when he says um, he's become my son, I wonder whether that's taken such ownership of him. That Pearl Fahima wouldn't be a slave or son. Well, that may be true too. <laughs> yes. And he, but he's very careful saying, I don't want to do anything without your consent. consent. Yeah. Uh, Remember we're talking about actually letting people participate in decisions that impact on them? What a wonderful example that is. I mean, this is a high-risk strategy for him. He's sending this guy back. He doesn't know what this guy's going to do. He could kill him. According to the law, he could. Isn't that true? But he's trusting in the spirit and in the process that he can reframe these relationships. It's extraordinary. You know, he's saying, I want to do this together with you as my partner, with your consent, and he says, without force, freely. To, to pick up the language here. It's just absolutely stunning stuff. Absolutely stunning. Now, what I would like to suggest to you is that then, so Paul started out on this process with his sponsor and supporters reframing these relationships um, in the hierarchy, in terms of mutuality, one at a time. And I would like to suggest to you that there is no shortcut to transform the world. There's no quick fix. There's only a slow, painstaking process of reframing every hierarchy in terms of mutuality. Now, it took Paul and his supporters years and years to reframe hierarchy in terms of mutuality. He had to fight every step of the way. But as he got older, when people were coming and saw him coming, they were said, oh my God, it's those people that are turning the world upside down. That's right, upside down. So they were creating spaces in society where those who were despised were honoured. Those that were excluded were included. They were turning the then known world upside down. In the context of the dominant institutions of the day, religious, political and economic institutions of the day. Now that is astounding stuff. Now, what I'd like to suggest to you, that we need to do this in every group, in every organisation, in every neighbourhood we're a part of. And what did I say to you earlier? We don't have to destroy people's ministry to create community. We just need to reframe the hierarchy in terms of mutuality, one relationship at a time. Right? Now, um, so what that means is when I joined St Andrews, I tried to reframe the hierarchy between the minister and I in terms of mutuality. Because I wanted to liberate him as, my, as well as myself. Right? So that we could meet as friends. Not just priest and parishioner, but as friends. Right? Isn't that what the liberation is all about? Um, notice that uh, Jesus started out with a hierarchical relationship with his disciples. Didn't he? He was the guru, they were the chalers. But after three years he said to them, I no longer call you servants, 
I call you? See the reframe? Now the interesting thing is, what reason did he go on to give to explain how there'd been a transfer of power in their relationship? He said, because everything the Father has told me, I have told you. Information is power, isn't it? People maintain power. Professionals maintain power over clients by protecting their expertise. That way they can charge people for it. It's true. That's the way it operates. But Jesus shared his power by sharing all the information. Do you get that? And that's why he empowered them. So they became his equals. And he actually went on to say, anything I can do, you can do better, which is my translation of greater works will you do. <laughs> do you know what I mean? Isn't that a dynamic, liberating process? But it took time. It took three years for Jesus to reframe those relationships from hierarchy to mutuality. And it will take us a long time too. So over a period of years, the way I did it with the, with the priest in my church was to um, take him out for coffee. Now, the, the, the important thing about that is you take them out of the church context where their priest, your parishioner, and you go out to a coffee shop where you sit around the table as Prince. equals. That's right. And then we talked about what we had in common. We're the same age. Talked about our, the struggles that we have in our age of life, stage of life. Talked about our, our relationship with our wives, our relationship with our kids, the things we were concerned about in the church. And in the process of sharing deeply and vulnerably with each other, we became friends. And then when you go back from the coffee shop, back into the church, you take your friendship with you. And even though, according to all the rules and regulations of the church, he has all power and I have none, the reality is we are friends and that changes everything. Do you, do you understand? I don't have to dis displace him. I don't have to dis depose him. Right? I just have to reframe the relationship of hierarchy in terms of, uh, 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 in terms of mutuality, which sets him free to be my friend and which sets me free to be his friend. Do you, do you understand that? Okay? Is that clear? Now, I believe that's the kind of transformation that Jesus wants in this world. For us to go into every group and every organisation and every neighbourhood and reframe the hierarchies in terms of mutuality. Is that clear? However, that is a long-term strategy. That may take generations. All right? So one of the issues that we've got to deal with, what do we do in the meantime? While we're slowly working on this process of transformation, it's taking a long time. It's very frustrating. What do I do in the meantime? Well, I'd like to suggest to you that Paul had a short-term strategy. The short-term strategy normally is this. <clears throat> Our analysis is that if there's no power at the bottom, there must be power at the top. Right? And so most of us think, I've got to get to the top somehow. That's right. Because up there, I'll be able to change things. Isn't, isn't that what we think? So we join the parish council, we get ordained, we become a pastor. The trouble is when we become a pastor, we find out we're in the top that we don't necessarily have the power to change things that we thought we did. Huh? Because the, peop the people at the bottom may not believe this, but the people at the top who are in this room will tell you that both the people at the top and the bottom of our church hierarchies are both locked into the system. It's true. It is true. They're both locked into the system. So <clears throat> the issue is, how do we work for change? Well, the interesting thing is that Paul, again, got the whole idea from Jesus. You know, he, he, 
Jesus said, don't try to move from the bottom to the top. He explicitly